Hey guys, my name is Eric, and today we're going to be talking about my body armor loadout and also what it would look like to have enablers in a Minuteman type community and what that looks like. So let's go ahead and roll the intro. Hey guys, thanks for checking out another Hatchet Cast episode. And today we're going to be talking about my fighting loadout, but also more specifically about the enabler role in a Minuteman community and what that would actually look like and kind of do a small brainstorming exercise on um, having that type of construct for a Minuteman or prepared citizen team, right? So before we get started, make sure you hit the like and the subscribe button. Also, share this video with a friend or a family member that would get something out of that that could use the knowledge and would benefit off of seeing our videos. That is a free way to support the channel, and we are really struggling to try and get our videos out there. So any help is, is greatly appreciated, and any support is massive to the channel. Also, if you have ideas about different enabler roles or would like to continue on the conversation, make sure you go to the comment section below. And if you have questions about how to set up your body armor or different ways that, you know, you could have your loadout, you know, put together, then go to the comment section. There's tons of people who are willing to help you out with any type of questions that you may have. So I want to talk about first, what is an enabler uh, on a military, you know, sense? And then also we'll talk about my fighting loadout and how I have my body armor set up and also what type of capability I bring to my Minuteman community and our team here in Florida. And then we'll talk about a brainstorming exercise that um, it would be really cool to kind of think about when it comes to an enabler in a Minuteman type of community and team and how that should dictate the way that you build your body armor or how you build your fighting loadout. So, Let's just go ahead and start it off with what is an enabler in the military sense of the term? So an enabler is somebody who brings an additional capability to that ground commander or that team leader outside of just a standard rifleman, right? So um, let me give you some examples. Uh, a JFO or a Joint Fires Observer. That dude is attached to that ground commander and that, that unit, and he can provide uh, the ability to find targets and call in artillery strikes. He can call in mortar fire. He can direct, um, you know, uh, attack helicopter fires. And he, he can provide a lot of that capability. And um, he's very, very effective. Like he calls in the big guns on the battlefield. The other thing uh, that could be attached to a unit is like a scout team. That scout team is going to provide that ground commander or that team leader the ability to kind of see further into the battlefield, a little bit further past the forward line of troops or otherwise known as the flot. Uh, they're gonna be able to give that commander some eyes that is gonna help him make his decisions when it comes to battle planning, understanding the, the scope of um, the type of targets that he has in his area, the type of adversary equipment that is in the local area, and help him to better mission plan uh, for future operations. And most of the time, your scouts are also going to be sniper qualified, like the Marines. They have the scout snipers. Uh, well, not anymore. Um, at least I don't believe they do. I think it's just the recon guys. But e either way, um, a lot of the scouts will also go to sniper school. So that sniper has now the ability to, one, fulfill a scouting role if he also needs to, B, 
be able to designate targets for artillery strikes and build target packages for that ground commander or allow that ground commander to be able to build target packages. Um, and also, if he needs to, take out high value targets with um, you know, his rifle. Uh, a sniper team also can really provide a very, a very strong psychological effect on the battlefield. You know, uh, there's nothing more terrifying than you know walking in a patrol and all of a sudden you just see the guy in front of you just get dropped and then you hear or maybe don't even hear the shot uh, and then you know that you've been found and targeted by a sniper. Uh, right now in Ukraine, like a lot of there's a lot of snipers, but also there's a lot of uh, scouts and observers that are directing artillery and they're doing it in the form of drones. So they're utilizing, you know, standard DJI drones to be able to uh, find targets on the battlefield and call in artillery strikes. And that is just, dude, it's terrifying to see some of those videos where uh, a unit is getting pounded by artillery. So that's super disheartening and, and honestly can cause a lot of um, side effects on the battlefield like you know, shell shock or extreme PTSD symptoms where now you have an enemy who not only may not even be injured, but they have psychological effects that are playing um, a role on their effectiveness on the battlefield. Then you also have like your guys that don't make holes all the time. Like they're not making holes or creating holes, they're plugging holes, and that is your medic or your corpsman. Don't be nasty. Uh, but your medics and your corpsmen, they have a, a massive role to play within that team. As far as a corpsman, that's a Navy sailor that is attached to a Marine fighting unit, and they are the medic for that team. You have your standard combat medic who is attached to a rifle platoon or a squad or whatever, and they are able to provide that battlefield coverage or that trauma coverage on the battlefield. So. Um, that is a huge, a huge deal uh, for for a team to be able to have a medic attached to them. So that way, you know, it literally will save your life. The other thing that uh, is a huge enabler and a huge capability for that ground commander is a canine type team. Canine handlers can provide a a lot of different things on the battlefield. Um, they can provide either security, like base security, by smelling, sniffing for bombs. Um, you know, sniffing out drugs, sniffing out personnel. Um, you know, there's canines can provide a ton of different things. They can also be attached to like direct action type units where they can be an attack type role. Um, they are also used in a bomb sniffing role where it's like for EOD type things where they're literally helping clear out routes. Um, so canine handlers have a huge role to play and also provide a big capability to that team leader. The other thing also is like your EOD or your explosive ordnance disposal technician. If, if you guys have seen the stuff that's happened in Ukraine, there are mines everywhere, dude. And it, also in the Middle East, they're on the GWAT, there was tons of IEDs. That was like one of the biggest things that were causing so many casualties uh, in the GWAT was IEDs. Um, so that EOD technician is able to kind of get rid of those mines uh, and dispose of them properly and safely. They can also clear routes so that way, you know, infantry or, or teams are able to go through a, a minefield in a safe route so they can clear out routes. Um, that also makes them high, tar high value targets. So a lot of people want to take out those EOD techs. Your, your adversaries are definitely going to want to try and shoot at them because they're essentially disposing of their mines. Um, in Ukraine, it's, there's these... Uh, a lot of mine delivery vehicles, so like whether that's rocket, uh, whether that's canister that is deployed from an aircraft, um, they will deploy, you know, either in place anti-tank mines or they'll put in anti-personnel mines. And those anti-personnel mines are not big, like as far as the explosion, it's just enough to like blow your foot off. Um, there's actually a mine called the Butterfly Mine, and it is a Soviet mine, and it's it's actually really sad because a lot of, it looks like a toy and uh, looks like a little like green plastic butterfly and it has just enough charge to literally blow your foot off. But the problem is, is that a lot of kids will pick them up and they, they play with them um, and uh, end up killing the child or, or blowing off at a limb or a hand. Uh, so it is, it is kind of tragic because the mine has no, it has no bias. It literally will target anybody that steps on it. So 
Mines are nasty things and EOD techs are able to get rid of those and literally save lives and they have a, a massive effect on the battlefield and even on the civilian population. Then you also have like your, your JTACs, your Joint Terminal Attack Controllers, and those guys can provide a massive capability. In fact, the DOD or the Department of Defense actually labels JTACs as a living weapon system because they can be employed so effectively by a ground commander that they can literally change the scope of a fight. Um, so a JTAC will call in air to surface fire, so like close air support from aircraft. They can call in surface to surface fires. They can call in naval gunfire. They can do uh, uh, designate targets for cruise missiles. Um, they have a huge capability that they provide. They can also battle track for that commander, so they're constantly keeping track of where friendlies are at, um, so that way they make sure they don't drop bombs on friendlies. Uh, and helping take some of that load off that ground commander with battle tracking. They can also coordinate like um, drone support and looking at drone feeds and, and providing that, that you know, recon by drone, um, looking for targets. And now JTACs are even, there's JTACs even being trained to employ like suicide type drones. So, uh, and, and very specific programs. But uh, JTACs have a huge capability that they can bring. Um, and also, at the same time, while they're synchronizing all of this kinetic effect, like fires, like gunfire from their wet rifle, you know, coordinating airstrike, coordinating artillery fire, they're also deconflicting the airspace, so that way airplanes don't crash into each other, or an artillery round or a missile doesn't strike into an aircraft while it's trying to drop a bomb, or an aircraft isn't dropping a bomb through another aircraft's airspace. They're doing all that stuff, and at the same time, they can coordinate Helicopters to come in and drop off more troops. They can coordinate helicopter gunships. They can coordinate AC-130 gunships. They can coordinate medevacs if they need to. Massive role to play. Uh, I've even uh, seen, you know, JTACs have also been used as a relay because most of the time a JTAC will have like a, a very powerful radio similar to a JFO or a Ford Observer or even a scout team. So they have that ability to reach far out when it comes to their comms. They're able to either you know, connect to a satellite or connect to um, other units that are farther away, you know, they have more capability as far as radios are concerned than like a typical rifleman or, or, you know, gunfighter in that squad. So they have a huge capability that they bring to the fight. The other one also is your survival specialist or your seer specialist. They, they are not only going to be training the air crew or pilots or special operations guys, on survival training and also evasion and, and resistance and escape type of techniques, um, but they can also help in combat search and rescue operations or CSAR. Um, they work closely with PJs who also are a, a huge uh, enabler on the battlefield. They uh, PJ or pararescuemen can provide uh, medevac or Kazavac support to that ground commander. They can um, also go far behind enemy lines to rescue down pilots. Uh, they can rescue lost personnel, all kinds of stuff. Uh, so PJs also provide a huge capability. And those are just some of the enablers. There's, also, there's other enablers that are out there in the military, but those are just a, an example of a few enablers that provide teams or fighting units a huge capability on the battlefield and are honestly a force multiplier. And so the American military or the U.S. military has done a really good job of creating enablers that bring additional effects that make that rifleman squad or that, that standard infantry or conventional or special operations unit much more lethal and much more capable. So when it comes to um, a Minuteman type of mentality when it comes to an enabler, what, what do I mean by that? What does that look like to have an enabler on a Minuteman type of role. So I wanna preface this next portion of the video in this way. Um, this is a brainstorming exercise and, and designed to kind of open up the conversation to be able to help you think a little bit more outside the box when it comes to setting up your body armor. And that's the whole reason for bringing up the enabler role. The other thing is if we're utilizing our body armor and we're wearing helmets and we are driving around in modified vehicles, at the, at the end of the day, it's because we're in a wartime scenario, we're in a wartime or conflict zone or a conflict state. So at that point in time, 
there's probably going to be military type equipment that will be proliferated throughout the region or eventually will be proliferated. But essentially, we're talking about a scenario where the world or the nation is in a state of conflict. So with that in mind, this is where we need to think outside the box as far as like, how do you set up your body armor? Um, and what does it mean to be an enabler for a Minuteman type of team? So for me, I'm thinking about, okay, well, if I have a Minuteman team and I want to, you know, make sure that I have force multipliers or people that give me more capability as an effective unit or an effective um, community, I want to look for people that have skill sets. Um, and I think it's important to look at how you can make your community more effective, more secure, more productive, safer, um, and also kind of bring back uh, the ability to one, rebuild that society. And you're gonna do that with your enablers and people who have skills and trades. Now, I'm gonna talk about, you know, you have your combat enablers, but also you have enablers who provide things in a support type role. And so I'm gonna be talking on, on both of those. Now, if I'm talking about a combat enabler, I'm talking about a person that can go out that provides a battlefield effect, kind of like I was talking about, you know, with the military side of enablers. Those guys provide those guys provide a combat effect on the battlefield, whether that's security, whether that's delivering a kinetic effect or, an, you know, an effect that kills people or blows up equipment or destroys targets. Like, that's, the, that's what I'm talking about. Um, so whenever you have a, a conflict and you've got, you know, guys who are veterans of militaries and are able to now um, utilize proliferated military equipment, they now become a combat enabler for your community, right? So like you get a hold of a, a tank, you now have a couple of mortars in your community. Now you got a couple of uh, anti-tank weapons. Like these are, you have veterans who know how to use that equipment and can teach others in that combat scenario or that warlike scenario where everything's falling apart, that civil war scenario, they can teach other people how to use that, but they're gonna be the subject matter expert that provides that. I mean, who knows, like what if your community gets a, a helicopter and you have the ability to maintain it and the ability to, to fly it and all that stuff. Well, now your combat enabler is gonna be a pilot. Um, uh, you're gonna have maybe some veterans that are air crew guys that used to work on a, on a Black Hawk and used to fly around in those. And now those guys are gonna be your combat enablers for your community, should your community be lucky enough to have that capability. Um, but some of the other ones that I wanna think outside the box are your, your, your support role enablers that um, really are massive to rebuilding society and also building up a safe community that is able to provide not just for the warfighter and for that that warfighting Minuteman, but also provide for that Minuteman's family, right? To provide for that warfighter's family and protect them and their kids. Um, so here are some examples of enablers that I foresee in a Minuteman role that would be super important. Like you have your carpenters, um, your machinist or your mechanics. Your machinist is able to, or your mechanics or your welders, they're able to build like anti-tank obstacles are able to weld up, um, you know, extra additional armor for your vehicles. They can uh, build turrets. They can build machine gun mounts for your vehicles and make them into an actual fighting vehicle that can be used on a combat role. Um, they're able to provide additional armor plating. We're seeing that actually in like Mexico, like the cartels, they're literally building out technical vehicles that are armored. Um, you have your machinists that are able to, to create things that are custom items for uh, you know specific parts. You also have your carpenters that are able to build trench networks. Um, they're able to build, um, rebuild buildings and infrastructure so that way you have housing for your families to be able to stay and to sleep in that community. Um, they can build up additional fortifications. They can build up trenches. They can build watchtowers. They can do those types of things to be able to build your FOB or your forward operating base essentially that your community will have if it's a complete collapse of society. So you have to think about when you're looking for people that have that capability or like, hey man, what do you do? It's like, oh, I'm a carpenter. It's like, cool, I've got, these are some things that, here's a list of things that we need built. Um, here's some 
uh, we need these watchtowers, we need um, these things constructed. So that's a huge thing for uh, someone to have that skill set to come to your community and also bring their family uh, to the community to be a part of as well. Then also you have like your nurses or your EMTs and those people that are able to provide medical skills and medical stuff to a community. Because we think about also like, well, I'm gonna do TCCC on the battlefield and I got my combat medic with me. And that's cool, but what happens when you go out on a mission and you get, one of your guys gets injured or multiple people get injured, you gotta bring them back somewhere. And so bringing them back to your Minuteman FOB and having EMTs and doctors and technicians or uh, you know um, nurse practitioners or EMTs, those guys are able to have that medical center in the FOB, your medical tent or your medical building that you bring your casualties to to be able to treat them. So um, having people who have that as a skill or that's their job, that's their trade, that's a huge deal. Especially like, you know, you gotta think about if there's a loss, a complete loss of society, doctors and nurses and medical staff are gonna be in high demand, absolutely high demand. And that's also something where you don't wanna take that surgeon and be like, all right, man, you're going out on this mission set and you're gonna go, uh, go do a supply run and put them in harm's way I was like, no, dude, you're staying at the FOB. We need you here to be able to, in case there's casualties, to save their life when we bring them back in that you know, improvised medical vehicle or that improvised Kazavac. Um, the other thing also is your, your teachers. Uh, I, I think a lot of us think about the Minuteman role with like, hey, we're going to go out on all these combat missions and do recce and all this stuff and have all these guns and, and have all the preparedness, but what about your kids? What about your families? And trying to give them a normal a normal type life, as normal as you can possibly make it. That, that role of that teacher and that, um, that, that caretaker who is going to take care of the elderly, that's going to take care of your kids, that's going to take care of the children and, and continue to teach them to raise up the next generation in a collapsed society type state, those people are going to be the ones that help rebuild society and rebuild countries. Like Teachers have a massive role to play. They help educate the younger generation that is living in a wartime scenario, in a wartime state. And so I think we forget about um, the people who have those types of jobs in society. They're going to be in high demand if society completely collapses and we have to rebuild it from the ground up. So that teacher role. The other one also is you got those people who run restaurants or you're a cook um, or you're a chef. One of the things that people do that in restaurants is they are able to also inventory food items. They inventory ingredients. They figure out what food items are running short and what they need to be able to create um, meals for the community that are also going to be nutritional and in, in, in complete nutritional value. Like, hey, you get your proteins, you get your carbs, but that cook is going to be the person that needs to know and how to ration all of those supplies and then also will dictate hey, we need to, we're running low on this. We need to go do a supply run and get that because our community farm is not producing that or it's not in season. So we need to go figure out how to find this to be able to supplement that or even say like, hey, we need to go do some hunting parties because we are running low on our, on our cattle here on the, on the Minuteman FOB. And so we need to go hunt some deer, go hunt some hog. And so that, that chef or that, that cook for the community is gonna be the one that's helping develop mission sets with uh, letting, letting the team leaders know and the community leaders know like, hey, we're running low on these supplies and we need, we need some. Uh, and some of your nurses and your EMTs, or your docs are gonna also let the, the people who are sending people out for supplies, let them know like, hey, we're running low on meds, we're running low on gauze, we're bandages, we need like clean, clean linen, we need all of these types of things. Um, and, and like I said, guys, these I'm not gonna be able to hit on all of them, but these are just some examples of people who provide a trade or a skill set that have a massive role in that Minuteman community to help rebuild society and also develop a, a Minuteman FOB whenever everything completely collapses. And so um, I, I kind of, I, just a, a side note and a caveat. One of the things that I think about is a one time I was working with um, a Green Beret team and and uh, one of the guys, the team leader, actually came up to me. He's like, "Hey man, so what do you what do you do?" 
and I was like, you know, I told him, I was like, this is why I'm attached to you, this is what I do, this is what I provide. And he's like, yeah, 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 I know about that, but like, what, what life skills do you bring to the team? And that always struck a chord with, like, like struck, not a chord, but like, it just like made an impact on me when he said that. Um, because those Green Beret teams, they have, they have applicable usage for life skills that every team member brings. So like if a Green Beret used to be a carpenter in his civilian life and then he joined the army and became a Green Beret, and now he's a 18 Charlie, which is a communications expert. Um, he also is still gonna be using some of those carpenter skills that he had in his civilian life on the Green Beret team. There's a possibility he'll possibly have to use those skills and, those, and that trade. And so that, that kind of helped me think about all the life skills that I've learned and all the hobbies that I've had and the, the things that I've picked up, like mechanical stuff, which I'm still working on, but like carpentry skills and, and all these other things that I can bring to the table to help my community and, and help be a, a productive individual when it comes to um, my Minuteman team. Some other ones is like a pilot. Uh, if you guys have the ability to be able to get an aircraft, whether it's a Cessna or, you know, that pilot comes and he's a part of your community and he's able to bring an aircraft, I mean, you can deliver supplies, they can provide search and combat search and rescue missions, um, they can provide, uh, you know, communications relay, so, um, you know, they can have that uh, a radio on the aircraft and if there's a team that's been sent out, that radio operator on the team is able to have line of sight with the aircraft and communi communicate to the aircraft and the aircraft can communicate back to the FOB at the, uh, you know, the, 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 FO the Minuteman Operations Center or the MOC is like I call it, the Tactical Operations Center. So like your headquarters little area where you have all of your planning and all that stuff happens in your FOB. So that pilot brings a huge role. And if you ever get the ability to have like a combat aircraft that is, you know, procured on the battlefield and have the ability to maintain it, like, that's a huge capability. Um, and, and people may laugh at that, but dude, the Taliban, they're a terrorist group and they are literally using Blackhawks now. And they have the ability to maintain it. They were able to procure all the equipment and stuff like that. So, like, there's, there's pure, there's a, a perfect example of uh, people utilizing military equipment in that way. Um, but uh, the other one also is like your, your engineer that's help, able to help design buildings, able to help with the, f the FOB layout, um, but also working with uh, maybe the carpenter and maybe with the machinist and also people who have combat experience and also uh, base security experience that are veterans. They're able to work together to be able to develop the defense layout of the FOB and, and also what needs to be built and also a good way to make sturdy structures and buildings for families to sleep in and to live out of. Uh, that engineer is going to have a huge role to play. The other thing is also like a software engineer that is able to really pick up on ham radio type stuff or a ham radio guy that used to be an enthusiast. That may be your, your Minuteman RTO, you know. He's able to go out on operations if he's really smart. Uh, he's able to stay at the FOB and he's now going to be the RTO for the FOB to to relay information or to receive information from other teams that are sent out uh, in combat zones. And so, you know, that, that comes into play. Um, I would even say even like your truck drivers, guys who drive tractor trailers that are able to, um, you know, know how to be able to transport cargo and equipment. Um, those guys are gonna be in huge high demand trying to deliver that stuff. And then also, you may have a truck driver that is driving those supplies, but also that truck or that tractor trailer is now loaded out with like defense on it. Like you've got gunners and machine gunners on it, trying to defend it from attack and from from uh, ambushes. So that way you can receive you know bigger shipments of supplies. Who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? But all I'm saying is is that thinking outside the box about what you bring to the table is so important. Um, some example, one of the examples that I think would be really applicable in almost a combat enabler role is something that we're seeing in Ukraine right now, which is your drone operators. So guys who race FPV drones or they have a drone business where they fly for like real estate companies or uh, do surveys, now those guys are going to be put into a role where they are doing, you know, scouting with their drones, maybe even doing targeting, uh, executing target packages with FPV style drones that are modified. Um, they could also be used in a role where 
um, they're providing relay. So one of the things that we're actually using in our community right now, and we're learning it, is a thing called Meshworks. And S2 Underground, which shout out to his channel, go check him out. Uh, S2 Underground did a video on Meshworks. Um, I think T-Rex Arms, um, Isaac from T-Rex Arms, he did a thing on, uh, on different networks and communications. So I would definitely go check out Meshworks. Um, but it allows you essentially to be able to utilize civilian version of ATAX to communicate via text back and forth as long as you have line of sight and a, and a strong enough power source to push that signal. So um, I'll talk about that on my, um, my fighting loadout here soon. But um, Meshworks is a huge ability that you have for your Minuteman community and that that ham radio operator is able to receive Meshworks messages or that drone operator can actually hook a Meshworks board to the bottom of the drone, elevate that drone. So even if you don't have a pilot that can fly an actual plane, you have a drone operator that can fly that Meshworks board and you can relay from a ground team that's forward out of doing missions. They can send Meshworks uh, messages, line of sight to the drone and the drone can send the relay those messages back to the base. So thinking outside the box with that type of stuff, I think would be super important. But a drone operator, his body armor loadout, if he was going to go out with a combat team um, or a Minuteman team, his loadout may be slightly different than a standard rifleman in the, in the Minuteman unit. So he may have to have you know, access to spare batteries. He may have his drone in a back panel. Um, he may have a backpack that he carries his drone in and his extra batteries. But he also has his FPV goggles that maybe he has for quick access. Um, he has spare rotor blades. All of these things come into play whenever he has to set up his body armor as far as what he needs to access quickly. So when it comes to being an enabler, um, like out forward on a team, you have guys who have a non-combat trade that could be utilized on a mission. And so one of the examples I wanna talk about, like for example, is let's just say you have a mission to go out and procure a medevac vehicle. Uh, you've got a couple of technical vehicles, but you guys are trying to find a van so that way you are able to transport casualties from the front line or wherever you're fighting back to the FOB and, and vice versa, be able to get medics out to a frontline unit. Um, so your mission set is to find a van. And uh, also at the same time, while you're looking for a van, you're also trying to procure additional parts from abandoned vehicles for the vehicles that you already have. So you have that mechanic that you bring with you. Well, if you're that mechanic, that Minuteman mechanic, um, one, it'd be important for you to be not a hindrance to the team where they have to babysit you. So you're very uh, savvy on your rifle skills, your gun handling skills, you're safe, you're effective, you know basic SUT, you know how to communicate with the team via hand signals or talk on the radio so that way you guys can use inner team comms. And then uh, whenever you get to a vehicle that you need to work on, you have the ability to access all your tools without having to take your body armor off. Or you can access some very general tools like multi-purpose type tools so that way you can do quick things and then get all of your, you know, your tasks knocked out in a very quick way so that way your team doesn't have to pull security for a long period of time. You guys can get the vehicle and get the parts and then get back to base camp as fast as possible. So that is a, a person who, or an enabler, that needs to really think about how they load out their plate carrier to be able to have, um, or their fighting load up, so whether their bag and their plate carrier, or their chest rig and their plate carrier, or in their, uh, in their bag, to be able to provide that mechanical skill set uh, to that community, and also have the ability to be able to go out on missions to be able to um, give that team and give that, that leadership additional capabilities that are thinking outside the box. Same thing with a drone operator. He needs to be able to access that drone quickly to be able to get that thing up. Uh, he needs to be able to uh, you know, do quick battery swaps without having to take his body armor off and ask somebody else to get the batteries out for him. He can just do it himself. Uh, and so this is where you can start thinking outside the box as far as your enablers that have non-combat skills. Um, now obviously an easy one is having you know, veterans or guys who have combat skills as enablers that can bring that effect to the unit or to that Minuteman team that makes them more lethal and more effective. 
now that we have an idea of just kind of thinking, you know, with that thought exercise, I'll talk about my fighting loadout and what I have on my body armor <clears throat> and the role that I would be fulfilling and providing uh, as far as providing additional force multiplying capability to the Minuteman team. So guys, we get a lot of support from you, the member, but we also do get some support from some companies and one company specifically we want to highlight is Shields. Now, the cool thing is they are a retail store, but they are an employee owned company and they have over 30 stores and counting and they specialize in outdoor equipment and gear. One of the brands that they actually carry, Eric, that is one of my favorite to look for all the time. You know how much I love bags. They actually carry Mystery Ranch. I was just in the market the other day looking for a new 24-hour assault pack that Mystery Ranch offers, specifically in the wax canvas. Shields had it for about one of the best prices that I could find on the internet. They do actually offer a, a price match guarantee if you choose to do that, if you find it cheaper somewhere else. But they had it for $179. Then they also offer their Slice program, where I was able to split that up into five equal payments completely interest-free, so my wife doesn't know exactly how much money I'm spending here. Nice. Well, if you end up making a mistake, Roy, and you get something that you don't like, they do have the Shields guarantee where you can actually get your money back guaranteed so you never are taking a risk. Tell me about the online store. Yeah, so if you guys want to shop online, just jump down into the description down below. You'll find the link for that. They're carrying tons of different other stuff like optics. They carry Vortex. They carry Leopold. Uh, check out uh, that section. So I'm going to cover the body armor loadout in a few different, with a few different categories. Um, I'm going to start off first with weapons. Um, when it comes to weapons, I have my primary, my secondary, and my tertiary. My primary is obviously going to be my rifle. And at minimum, I'm going to have seven mags on me. So on the front of that plate carrier, you're going to have three mags. Underneath the arm are, is uh, one mag, and then I have a mag on my belt, and then a mag in the rifle as well as another mag that I would keep in my pocket. Um, the reason why I have a mag in my pocket specifically is if I have to ditch everything, then I at least have that one mag that's in the pocket just for safekeeping and also for crappy situations. But they at least have seven mags. Sometimes if it's gonna be a long walk, maybe just have, or I, I'm expecting to get into contact, I might just carry a D60 inside that rifle, so like a 60 round drum. Um, the D60 is, is legit. As far as secondary weapons, I carry a pistol. So it'd be a Glock, MMP, or excuse me, Glock. It'll be a Smith & Wesson MMP 2.0 metal with a SRO and a Surefire light on there. And then I will have three mags on the belt. So two pistol mags and then one mag in the pistol itself. Now, the way that I look at pistols is a lot of people will look at it, and I think it's a skewed way to look at it, where it's just as a backup weapon. And you have to kind of think outside the box with that. Um, the pistol is designed for a different type of role. Um, so look at it as an additional tool to have in your toolbox. Sometimes it's easier to do stuff with a pistol while you're trying to do another task, and at the same time still pull security. Um, so having that pistol is not just going to be a, an emergency backup weapon. Yes, it does fulfill that role, but it also has additional applications that you can use it for. Um, sometimes it doesn't make sense to bring a pistol, depending on what you're doing and how far you're walking or where you're gonna be. Um, and then other times it does make perfect sense. So either way, my, my secondary weapon system, it will be that pistol. The tertiary weapon system is the Tor Serpent knife on my plate carrier. Um, that is just a backup weapon if I need to, for whatever reason, if it needs to be something that's quiet, um, there's that knife there for that. So that's the weapon systems that I'm gonna be carrying on the plate carrier. Um, let's move on to medical. Now, as far as my IFAC, I like to carry two. And the reason why is because if I have to ditch my body armor, I have an IFAC that's on my belt. So I have an IFAC that's always on my body because of that belt. I usually will carry a tourniquet actually in my arm pocket. So. If you guys have a SOP that you establish with your little team or your community, I would recommend establishing one for your medical and where you have your IFAC placed. That way, whatever guy you're working on that gets hit, you know exactly that where the tourniquet's going to be. Um, you know exactly where his IFAC's going to be. So in the stress of the moment, you guys are able to effectively patch up that casualty. Um, one of the things that the military did is they standardized IFAC placement and tourniquet placement. Like it was an actual like rule, like 
Once you're here in a combat zone, you got to have your tourniquets here and your IFAX in here. So that way, no matter if you were an airman or a soldier or a Marine, you guys all had an idea of where that uh, IFAC and tourniquet was uh, at any given moment. So for my body armor, my IFAC placement is on my right side, so that way it does not interfere with my pistol side, and I have it actually behind my arm, so that way it doesn't interfere with me just setting, it's more comfortable that way. Um, just having it where it's behind me and it has a quick pull tab, what pulls up in that zipper and everything comes out, so that way that medic um, or battle buddy or whatever can help patch me up, my, my comrade. Navigation. Navigation is super important because it helps you, one, you may end up becoming a point man. You know, if you're walking on patrol, you may be designated as a point man. Um, if you're trying to find your way back and you have to evade, like say for example, you get separated from your team and you gotta figure out how to get back to base camp. But also it's just good to have a, a good sense of direction and know your map and have all the, the products and stuff with you and the tools with you to be able to know where you are and where to go and how to you know, identify where targets are at and to be able to give back that you know, give back intel to your community via assault report. Having navigation tools is super important. It's not only just for navigating, but it's also for plotting grids and all those types of things when it comes to um, maps and things of that nature. So I will carry a compass. On my left side, I carry it inside of a Blue Force Gear speed pouch. Um, that is a backup compass. My primary compass I actually use is on my belt, and it's actually in a little pouch um, right by the front of the buckle. And so I'm able to pull that compass out very quickly and easily through feel. I don't have to reach somewhere that's awkward because I'm probably gonna be using that compass quite often to be able to kind of orient myself to my surroundings. So that's another thing is like with your equipment, guys, especially like things that you're gonna use all the time, even if it's an enabler tool that you may have, like a specific tool that's very special to what you do and, your, and the skill that you bring, you wanna have it in a place where it's easily accessible, not somewhere where it's like, man, I use this all the time and I have it in a spot on my body armor that I can't reach and I can't figure out how to get to it. Uh, outside of just taking it off, my body armor off and then getting it or asking somebody else to give me a hand. Uh, so you need to be able to access that stuff on your own and that will also help you dictate where you place your pouches and where you place your equipment. So I will also have um, like navigational tools like my maps and my protractor and my um, fields of fire ruler um, my uh, range finding card that I have from Black Hill Designs or my Shab Shack Security uh, range card. I will keep all of that stuff, all that navigational equipment and, and reference material inside my map pouch because I'm probably gonna reference it pretty often. Um, so I have that in my map pouch that's in the front. Now what's really cool about the map pouch on this, this uh, JPC, this is actually a prototype that's gonna be coming out here soon and this is a Malion ghost map pouch. Now we have our traditional ghost map pouches, which are, which are Velcro on the back and Velcro on the front. And that gives you the ability to have a map pouch behind your placard or on your chest rig. So you can carry those navigational tools or those, those maps and things of that nature, your notebooks. But this one is mollied onto the front and we actually haven't, we're coming out with a release date on that soon. But for your military vests, like your, your standard issue IOTV or your marine vests or your JPCs, where that, that, that flap is sewn on to the body armor and you can't take it off, you can't actually put a placard on there, what the map pouch does is it mollies on to that, that flap and that way you can actually you know, get some clips and actually attach any type of placard that you want to a standard military type vest and you have a ghost map pouch on your, on your kit now. So I think map pouches are super important. It helps you to carry all those documents um, and you're probably gonna reference them pretty, pretty frequently. Now the other thing I will carry is also GPS. So I'll have a wrist Garmin. So you have the Garmin 601 or uh, a handheld Garmin unit. So that way I can utilize GPS um, to help me be more conscious of my position or to battle track, what have you. So that's something that, you know, for me, I would like to be able to coordinate with other units and other teams to figure out where they're at, um, to be able to battle track them, to be able to give them direction about where to go or how far we are, we've, how far away we are from an objective, to be able to give that point man like an idea of like, hey, here's how far we are um, and here's how much further we need to go, um, what have you. 
GPSs are super good to have. Just get one and have it on your wrist or have it on a place where you can easily grab it and reference it on the fly without having to take all your equipment off. Now for my comms, I'm running two radios. Now I'm actually probably gonna end up running three radios here soon. So the two radios, one of them is gonna be for inner team. The other radio is going to be for reaching back to base camp or talking to a drone operator or someone else to relay that comm uh, back to the Minuteman FOB. So one is for inner team, the other one is for Minuteman FOB, and that's for calling in a Kazavac if we need a medevac, like I need, I need medics here now, we've got a mass casualty situation, or we need additional, you know, additional forces to be able to come because we're we need reinforcements. Um, it could also be used for talking to the drone operator and being like, hey man, like what do you see? Give me some essay on what's going on. Um, so having that other radio is going to be for reaching back to the base. Now, understand you, not everybody's gonna need two radios. Uh, in fact, I would encourage only one person or two people, your, maybe your team leaders or your guys who are gonna be your radio operators on your team, only those guys have the two radios. So that way, your radio line that goes back to the base doesn't get clogged down with inner team type comm. So you can have every team member have a, a single radio so they can communicate amongst themselves but then have one radio or two radios, whether that's with your team leader and your RTO, to be able to be the lifeline back to the FOB for whatever you need. So I'll be carrying two radios. I'm actually gonna have a third radio that I'm gonna be carrying possibly on my back. And all those pouches that are on the back of the JPC is not for direct action. Yes, it can fulfill that, but those are all general purpose type pouches from Lunar Concepts. You can actually get them at Wiseman Company. They're called guppy pouches but they're so big and I can stick whatever I want in there. It can be extra water bottles for people. It could be extra food. It could be um, additional comm equipment, which most of the, most likely it will be additional comm equipment. So like my Meshworks board will be in there connected to a radio so that way I can have the ability to talk using the ATAC system and Meshworks to be able to communicate with the inner team and then also have a radio that's powerful enough to push back to a relay station or relay drone to be able to talk back to base camp and pass intel or data or updates, what have you. So um, that's what those pouches on the back are for. Most likely is going to be for a comm suite. And then also, you know, other stuff that I have different comms that I use on that back panel, or excuse me, those back pouches that, you know, you, you end up filling up that back space pretty quick because with a lot of the communications equipment that's out there, it's a lot of stuff to carry. For my signal stuff, I want to be able to um, signal other units. I want to be able to signal other teams. I want to be able to provide um, friend versus foe type uh, procedures, utilizing certain signal equipment. Um, I can use it to talk to a drone to give them an idea of our location, to let them know that we're a friendly unit. Um, also, I can utilize that to be able, if we have a pilot for whatever reason that's inside our Uniman community and has the ability for us to have an air asset, having that ability to signal that air asset is going to be huge. So that's going to be my VS-17 panel. Um, it will be also, I will have a flare and a flare gun. So that way if I need to, you can use that for so many different applications. Um, and for the VS-17, you can also use that as nonverbal uh, communications to coordinate, you know, different types of um, operations, different types of troop movement, all that type of stuff. So you, you can use it for so many different things. The other thing I have is also for a nighttime type of uh, signaling, uh, a buzz saw. Now I did make a, I have a traditional buzz saw, which is just a chem stick with a counterweight or a weight on the end of it, and then a 550 cord paracord string and you spin it around and it creates this massive circle that you can see under nods if you're using an IR chem stick. If you're using overt chem sticks, it's a big giant green circle that's spinning around or whatever color chem stick you got. And so it's an easy, silent way to get people's attention to be able to coordinate signal between different entities um, without having to go over the radio or talk or whatever. Um, the big thing about signal type equipment is you need to make sure that you establish an SOP or a standard operating procedure or a technique that you have as a, as a mutual agreement and contract within your team and within your group. So um, when it comes to signal stuff, buzzsaw is super effective. Now I did invent, I think I invented it, a multi-use buzzsaw. 
Um, one of the things with buzz saws is you crack it once, you have to cut that chem stick off and make it again. So you have to reuse, like remake your buzz saw. Well, the one that I have, because I didn't have multiple IR chems, is I took three or six chem sticks and I put them into the same line and I have them electrical taped. So that way they are stuck together. The chem sticks, the additional chem sticks are now my weight. So it's enough weight for me to be able to swing that uh, in a circle. And then also whenever I have uh, a chem stick that I need, I just cut that electrical tape at that one chem stick, crack it, and then I can swing it around. And then it stays on there because once I use a different chem stick that's not burnt out, that dead chem stick will be additional weight. So it replaces that weight that I have. Um, Another signal thing that I have is going to be smoke grenades. So you can use smoke grenades for evacuation, egress, to signal for Kazovac. Um, you can use it to cover your, your retreat or your exfil. So smoke grenades are huge. You got to have them. Um, you can get airsoft ones. They're super, super useful, a really good tool. And it's a good signal device that you can use. Just make sure you guys have an SOP established and how you want to use it. Um, the other thing also I have is for a signal is a flashbang. Now it can be used for um, obviously room clearing or whatever, but you can also use it in a survival role. You can use it as a signal role. Um, it can be used to initiate something. Um, so I do have a single flashbang that I do keep on me for signal or whatever it needs to be used for. Um, the other thing I have that's a super useful signal tool is my signal mirror. So I was talking to you about that air asset and using a signal mirror can be good for air, you know, ground to air. It can be good for signaling another team. And I want to do it quietly so I can actually aim that signal mirror through that hole and actually aim that fireball from the sun, that little glare and that glint to another unit. Um, so you can see signal mirrors for miles. If you guys have ever seen a video of a signal mirror being used from the air to the ground, it's insane how far you can actually see that thing. Understand all of these signal devices do also provide or do, you know, have some risk. Um, the risk of being seen, the risk of receiving enemy fire. So you guys need to establish a good SOP for what signal you're going to use, how you're going to use it, and be very disciplined about making sure you use the correct signals to communicate effectively and also with the least amount of risk. Now, another signal device that I, that I got recently is kind of was to replace one of the signal devices I had in the military, which was an IR laser that was called an ISLID, and you can actually laze or mark targets with it, so that way people could all see what you're looking at. Um, and it was nice because I didn't have to actually point my rifle at something, or if I was trying to get someone's attention, I would just like jiggle it and uh, do that to be able to get them to look at something. Um, so having that laser marker is kind of nice, so I got an actual overt laser the amp is an Amazon $30 laser, but it's super powerful enough where you can see it during the day. And that's primarily when I would be using it um, is for that daytime signal. But that is also an outside of the box type of thing that you can have. If you can't afford, obviously nobody can afford, not everybody can afford an ISLID. Um, the other signal device I have is I have an IR strobe on my helmet and I have an IR strobe on my body armor. Um, you ever heard of the rule two is one, one is none? So having multiple strobes to be able to signal air assets or friend versus foe or to signal other units, uh, like I said, it's just another tool in the toolbox. Now some special equipment that I do have that is really useful to me is like obviously I have a notebook and a pencil or a pen. I also have my maps and my products that goes my navigation stuff, but I also have like my red lenses. So I have a red lens that's on my, it's called a bite light. It's actually a Petzl or Princeton Tech um, bite light that's on my boom mic for my helmet. So at night I can use a red lens and I can look at my notebook with that red lens. And I also have a glow in the dark pad notebook. So that way I can reference and read notes or battle track or whatever I have on that notebook and I can use it at night. I do also have a handheld red lens that can has a filter, it's from Gerber, it's called the Gerber Scout. And you can actually turn the, the bezel on it and um, it will turn green, white, blue, or red. And it's super dim, it only has one setting and that's by design so that way you can use it to be able to read your notes or read things or look for things without having a ton of light uh, pollution. So I do also have a handheld single flashlight and that has a AA battery, a single AA battery and that's by design because 
Everybody's got AA batteries, but um, having a flashlight that is just a white light that I can use is, is really nice. Now on my helmet, I do have a, um, a red lens that is a Princeton Tech light, but, and it has like a little like arm on it, but it's not been super reliable. So the one I have on there, I think is a third one I've owned. Um, I'm just waiting for it to give out, but yeah. Now on my helmet itself, I do have Peltors and I have helmet uh, comms and they are actually dual lead. So that way I can use them for my push to talks. And I forgot to mention this on the comm portion, but when I push to talk, whatever rifle shoulder I use, so if I'm left-handed, I'm a southpaw shooter, whenever I shoulder that rifle, I've actually had before in the past where I would have my buttstock accidentally push the push to talk and it would hot mic or actually transmit when I didn't want it to. So now I have my push to talk oriented inwards where the button is facing inwards. So that way when I shoulder the rifle, the buttstock doesn't hit the push to talk and I'm not gonna hot mic on the net. Um, if you hot mic, it's also hard for, no, people can't transmit whenever you're hot micing. And also it's really annoying and it can give away your position if people are trying to triangulate on that radio source. Um, now on my push to talks, I'm very particular about having a button that is very, very clicky. Like it, I can feel the audible or feel the click of the push to talk. So that way I know I'm pushing to pushing it in. Um, I've actually had push to talks in the past. I've used tons of them where it was very soft and you could barely like, is this pushing or is it not? Um, so I like to have a push to talk that has a very good, strong click to it. Uh, and the push to talks I have are from Disco 3.2. I highly recommend them. They work great for Beofing. The other thing I have is obviously I got a carabiner on my, um, my belt and I have a carabiner on my plate carrier. Carabiner on my plate carrier is not a locking one. It's just a plain carabiner. So it's just for like admin type stuff. But I do have a locking carabiner on my back and I also have uh, tubular nylon webbing on the bottom of my plate carrier. And that is for making into an expedient litter. It can be used for uh, pulling things up. You know, if I'm on the second story of a building, I can use that to drag things up the building. Um, I can use that to drag away a casualty. Um, it can be used for me to be dragged away uh, by my, my team. Um, there's tons of usage for it. I can actually use it for a Swiss seat so I can hasty repel if I have to in a pinch. Um, and that's what the locking carabiner is also for, is to be able to use that for a hasty, hasty repelling harness, like called a Swiss seat. Um, so having tubular nylon on you is super, it's super convenient, super nice, um, and, and good to have. It's super modular. Now, some other stuff that I do have is I also will have a electrical tape. It's just something I picked up along the way, um, is having electrical tape. Like, I can use it to repair antennas, I can use it to repair broken wire. Sometimes you'll have that remote switch on your rifle or something comes off on your rifle and you can use, I've seen guys like a light mount breaks and they just use electrical tape to tape that light onto the rifle because that's all they got. So having electrical tape on your body armor, super convenient. It's actually very, very useful. Um, it's something that I have on me. I also have medical shears and I got that from my buddy Todd who is our medical instructor. And uh, if you want, make sure you sign up for medical class. We'll be having those classes posted soon. But uh, I do have a set of medical shears and I use them obviously for medical stuff, but honestly I use them to like cut open MREs. I use them to cut open stuff. Um, I use them in an admin role quite a bit. So having a good pair of medical shears is super legit. The other thing I also carry is an armband, like a football quarterback sleeve, and that is for writing down special information. Um, I can use that for easy reference of things. So like, hey, if, I'm, if, I, if I have printed up grids or um, you know, special important information, I can use that for quick reference and I can also write on it. So having that ability to be able to write something down real quick without having to pull my notebook out, because remember, while you're doing all this stuff, these, these other roles, you also have the possibility you may have to also shoot. So like you're shooting at somebody or shooting at a target or uh, bad guys, and then you write something down, write down some information, shoot some more. You're coordinating comms with different teams, with a drone guy, like, so a lot can happen. Um, and so having that quarterback sleeve is, is really useful and I find it really nice. Um, and then the other thing also is like, uh, I have a Hilo lanyard. The Hilo lanyard I keep on my belt. Um, obviously it's for Hilo stuff, but I've also had it where you're riding on the back of a pickup and if you're running the gun, like you're running on a turret, clipping that Hilo lanyard in to uh, the turret so that way you don't go flying out 
uh, is actually kind of useful or just using it to lock in or to use it to retain your rifle if you have to retain your rifle. So Gila lanyards are actually pretty useful for a lot of different myriad of things. A lot of the stuff I have in my body armor guys is for specific roles that I'm looking to be able to um, fulfill and also uh, take care of certain jobs. And so my body armor is specifically built for those types of roles. So whenever you're building your body armor, the whole point of today was to talk about one, have a thought exercise about you thinking about all the skill, skills and capabilities that you can bring to a community that we don't really think about because we get so caught up in like the gunfighting portion or even all the cool tactical stuff. You have to know that stuff. That's like a basic responsibility is knowing how to you know, utilize your rifle, knowing how to have your weapon stuff loaded out on your plate carrier, knowing how to ha use a pistol. Um, those are all, knowing how to do SUT. Those are all basic skills. Those are your basic individual responsibilities. Knowing how to do medical, TCCC stuff, that is your responsibility. Those are basic things that you should know. And then your real skill set that you learn, that's that trade or that um, enabler skill, that's what you bring to the table. And that's what makes you effective as a force multiplier for the community. So when you're building out your body armor, if you have those types of skill sets that can really be a big impact in the community, think about that whenever you're building out your plate carrier or your body armor, or even if you don't have a community right now, when you end up going to a Minuteman community or finding a community near you of guys who are like-minded, prepared citizens that want to train, you can be like, hey, this is what I do for, for a living. This is the trade skill that I can bring and here's how I can be useful to the group. So I hope you guys got something out of that. I know it was a very long-winded video, but I, it's been something I've been thinking about for a long time and um, wanted to kind of help bring a video that was thinking outside the box when it came to building out your body armor loadout and how you put your plate carrier or your fighting loadout together. So guys, I wanted to talk specifically to you about um, a, a certain set of armor that is super, super important. And it's actually in Ephesians chapter 6, and I'm going to read it. And it starts in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray, this is the most important part, guys, and pray in spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare fearlessly as I should. Guys, God calls us to be warriors for his kingdom. Our fight is against the principalities of darkness in this world. And the best way to wage spiritual warfare is to be able to witness and talk to others about the salvation and the saving grace of Jesus Christ. There are so many people out there who need hope, who are living in a world. I mean, we're talking about preparing for the collapse of society. Like, the world is, is losing hope every day. And people are always looking for hope. They're looking for that peace. They're looking for compassion. They're looking for all of those things and they can find it in Jesus. But we as Christians have to be bold and we have to open our mouth and we have to speak. And that is how we wage spiritual warfare. Just like Dr. Heiser said, uh, he's a very famous uh, theologist, and he says that the best way to wage spiritual warfare is to witness to others around you and to snatch them away from the kingdom of darkness out of the grasps of Satan and the demons. 
And so, guys, we put on the armor of God to defend ourselves against the evil one. And whenever troubles and, and hardships come your way, that's why God says He is the strong fortress and we run to Him. I'm totally fallen, dude. Like, I am just like, like I'm just a normal guy. Like, I, I mess up all the time. I'm, I'm always struggling trying to be a better husband and a better father to my kids. And I mess up a lot. And I'm always fallen. But I have that comfort in Jesus. And I have that hope in Him, knowing that He is the one that I can find peace in. And He is also loving and merciful and for, full of forgiveness and love. And so, guys... There is hope in the Lord. And so make sure you put on that full armor of God. And whenever you're going through a hard time, pray without ceasing. Always pray. And if you have a prayer request, send it to us. We would love to pray for you. We would love to pray with you. As you're going through this hard season in your life, so are we. And let's go through this hard season together. You and I. And we will go through it and we will pray together and we will get through it together because the Lord is with us and we are going to fight through that spiritual battle together. And so I just want to leave that note with you guys. Make sure you guys are also going out and getting training spiritually, physically. If you want to come train with us, go, so, go to the website and sign up for our class. We'd love to train with you guys and also talk about the Lord with you guys and, and minister with y'all and, and fellowship. And um, we're all in this together, man. Like there is no, you know, us versus them. It's, it's, we're all in this together. We all need the Lord. And this world needs more hope and more love and needs salvation and the saving grace of Jesus Christ. So, guys, thank you so much for checking out this episode. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Check out our Instagram for any behind-the-scenes type stuff, as well as our Spotify and our YouTube channel. The HatchetCast Podcast is also on YouTube. Um, but the HatchetCast Podcast on Spotify, go check that out. And come train with us. Go to the website. And if you want to support us, you can go there and find ways to support us there. Um, but... If you ever need any prayer, or if you don't know who Jesus is and you want to know who he is, get a hold of us. We'd love to send you guys a Bible. Make sure you train to be the eternal asset. Minister to others, spread love and peace, and we'll see you guys on the next one.